Excuse me for doing that. Uh, but anyhow, Dale is the one that arranged everything happened. And the way this society grows, we're all volunteers, we find somebody who's good at something. And Dale has proven he's good at finding us a speaker on the last minute. So he's going to be our new membership, our new uh, program director. Because <laughs> he's <laughs> good for him. So anyhow, I won't have to worry about who's going to be our next speaker. I'll let Dale worry about that. Uh, anyhow, the next, the next event, and I, I made some photocopies of this. This is the powwow down in Nescapec, or down in Drums, rather, down in um, Cunningham Valley. Uh, next weekend, 18th and 19th. Do you want to go? How are you? Good. All right. Are you ready to go? You Ready. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Uh, Joe needed a speaker, and I was available because I'm always available. Um, it's a. T they said the topic was the American Indians, and I had already done one of those once before, and I had a display set up in my borough building of American Indian artifacts, so I just gra went over there, grabbed everything, threw it in a bag, and, and we headed down here. So I didn't have a lot of time to prepare anything. So I, I'm going to have to read a little bit, but as far as the Indians in this area, we don't know a lot about the Indians because they didn't write us any letters. They didn't write us any books. They didn't really have any way of, of you know, getting the, the message to us that they were here because they didn't know us. Uh, so some of the Indians wrote on cave walls and things like that out west. I've seen some of the, the writings on the walls and caves when I was in the Boy Scouts. But around here, you don't find that. You don't see that. The caves that were here are small, not like they are out west. So you don't see a lot of that. But they did leave things. And some of the things they left are some of their tools. So that's how we know a little bit about them. They had, you know, rubbing stones. And you find, find rubbing stones on, on wherever their, their uh, villages were. They had stones that they used for pounding and mashing their cornmeal and for leather, for rubbing leather. They had tools. Don't ask me what it is or why it was like this, but it's heavy. And it's got a, a, a head like it would be a hammer. It's completely flat on the top, smooth as could be, where it would be rubbed in. And if it was like, if this was a weapon on a big stick and they hit you with this, there would be nothing left. And these are what they used as their really crude weapons early on. When you hear a lot of people talk about arrowheads, and they, I brought a couple with me, and I'll, I'll pass the, the, the tray right around and you can look at it. But you'll see in here, this is a little scraper that was used for scraping leather. This is a scraper, that's a scraper. These are what you would see and look at as arrowheads. Some have the little notches in them for arrows and, and some don't. But they're not really arrowheads. That's what the, everybody calls them. Everybody calls them arrowheads. These are spear points. Arrowheads are tiny, real small. And they didn't use a lot of arrows early on. They used arrows late in when they had to fight against the white man. They had that's when they got a little bit more knowledge, a little bit learned from the white man and they started making better tools, better weapons. The uh, early tools that they used were just crude stones. And these are same thing. These are from different parts of the country, but these are spearheads. They're not arrowheads. Arrowheads would be about the tip of these and, and uh, we had a couple of guys that came up to German and put on a display and they had their arrowheads, they're like your fingernail they were that tiny and they have it, they notched them onto a shaft and then they put the feathers on them but they didn't do that early on so they when they were first hunting they were using spears and they were using tools, uh, it was a spear and then they had a handle that held it and they would throw it and it was like a an added like added way to get more distance and more force behind it to throw it and I forget how what it's called but uh, that's what they used to hunt they didn't they didn't hunt like with the bow and arrow like like you see on TV and they didn't they didn't get to doing that until it, later on in the 1800s when they learned a little bit more about making tools and how to refine them and things like that uh, a little bit about our area though is we know there are Indians here. We, we don't know how many. 
Uh, there's all kinds of books that tell you there was this many and that many, but we don't know. It's, it's just a good estimated guess. But I had a gentleman bring me some stuff down when I did, did put on a presentation at the Masonic Lodge, and he found these artifacts at Chapman Lake. So we know at Chapman Lake there was a small village. Uh, I had another guy bring me some artifacts that were found on the ledges up, up going out of German on 107. They call them the black and the white ledges. There's some artifacts found from there. Uh, we do know that there's a lot of artifacts by the Susquehanna River. We know there was a lot at the mouth of the Lackawanna River. At the Lackawanna River and the, the confluence of the Lackawanna and the Susquehanna was a big, big village. And there, archaeologists have been digging down there for years and years and years and pulling out all kinds of artifacts. I worked on uh, a project up in Tunkhannock where they put the Tunkhannock bypass in. I worked for about six months up there digging artifacts with the archaeologists from the state of Pennsylvania. And they were pulling out pieces of pottery, um, arrowheads, flint pieces. They were showing me, and one of the things I learned was you'll find a little, you'll, you'll scrape the ground clean, and then you'll find a, a charred round circle. And then you'll find another charred round circle over on this side. And that was the post that went in the ground over a fire pit where they would put their spit and turn it and cook a whatever they they were hunting and they'd they'd find all of these they'd find uh, seven or eight or nine of them in a circle which would be like a teepee uh, teepees were not real popular around here mostly longhouses but they did have them uh, longhouses were very popular in the Susquehanna Valley and they were big long wooden made out of trees wooden structures with roofs on them that they all lived in and up on the uh, Susquehanna River there's a lot of places where there were villages. What the Indians did was they lived by the, the rivers in the summertime because that's where the animals went to drink and that's where the, they could fish and it was, it was in the open where they could protect themselves. And then in the winter time they would go up into the mountains, they would get away from the wind, they'd find a place where they could put shelter, sometimes they'd find a cave, they'd build a lean-to against the, the, the eastern side of the mountain so that the wind blew over the top of the mountain and didn't blow into them. They would never go on the western side because the wind would blow right at them because the, the wind mostly blows from the west. So that's, that's the way they lived their lives and they traveled a lot. They didn't they didn't stay in towns like we do. Later on they did. Early on they traveled and that's all they did. They kept going where the animals were. And we talk about our roads in this area and the roads were uh, animal paths. That's, what, that's how our roads started. And the Indians followed the animal paths to hunt. So the Indians would make those paths just a little bit bigger. And then the trappers would travel those same paths and they'd make them a little bit bigger. Well then when the white man came, the white man had wagons and uh, we had cannons and we had all kinds of things that we brought here so we had to make the paths even bigger. I was just reading a book about George Washington and his history and it talks about how he came out of Virginia into the Shenandoah Valley and then out to, going out towards Fort Duquesne, which is Fort Pitt, and they were going out there because the French had the fort out there and the English colonists, they wanted that fort. Well, they met Indians and they talked to Indians and they had interpreters and they had tried to get the Indians to uh, side with them. Well, the Indians would rather side with the French because the French had more. They had more trinkets to give them and the French were uh, a bigger army at the time than the colonists were. So it, I read about George Washington making the roads to go there. They had to send out a, a group of their soldiers ahead of them with the Indians as guides to cut down the forest so that they could pull their cannons. That's how we got our roads. Uh, that's just something I was, in fact, I was just reading that the other night. A uh, couple of the things, one of the things about Indian artifacts and the laws, it is illegal to collect any artifacts off of uh, federal uh, land or state land. You can't pick up artifacts and take them and keep them if they're on a federal in a federal forest federal land or state land if you're on private land you can take them and you can keep them uh, unless they have something to do with burial 
If they have anything to do with a grave, you can't touch them. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people take things all the time from different places. But you've got you to understand that, that this is part of the Indians' heritage. And now that the Indians are starting to want to come back and get all this stuff back from the people that have been collecting it. Um, this piece here tells me a little bit about the Indians around here because I found it very close locally, not too far away. I was on a walk with my son and my grandson and we were looking for the Indian caves. We were walking up on the mountains looking because we heard all these stories over all the years. So we were looking for Indian caves and we found some caves but they happened to be inhabited by these black things. <laughs> and they were a little bigger than us so we didn't explore the caves too much so we walked we walked a little bit in the streams and things and we walked down into a valley and my son said come here he says I can hear water so we I took my grandson and we, I followed him down and we went down into this valley and it was real steep on this side and real steep on this side with a stream going down through the middle and we walked down and I said I don't know I said they, the Indians usually lived up on a plateau or someplace where they could see. They traveled the tops of mountains because they always wanted to be able to see their other Indians that were attacking them and they wanted to be able to see the white settlers and the smoke from their chimneys and everything. So we went down through this valley and I, I had my doubts and I walked down and stream came down and made a turn and there was a, a little area no bigger than from that chair to here that was dry and it had what looked like a fireplace like rocks stacked and it was char there was charred stuff in the middle of it and right behind it was a stone wall that was built in a semicircle of just stacked stones they were just stacked up no like they weren't built by somebody who was really building a wall for a, for a beautiful wall they were just stacked but they were in a semicircle and a tree was growing up in the back of the semicircle and I said, this looks like something was here. I don't know if it was a homeless person here and they just looking. And I turned around and I looked down in the stream and I found this. It was just sitting right there looking at me. This is a carved out bowl. And I couldn't believe it. I said, I, can't, I just, can't. if this was sitting this way, it's a rock. <laughs> You'd never find it. It just happened to be perfect sitting right there. Uh, and I just, I said, oh, so I'm going back. I'm not not giving up yet I'm going back this is an Indian blanket uh, this was given to me by Tom Cluffer I, a lot of people know Tom he's probably spoke here on several occasions and you'll notice the insignia on there that's an Indian signal and symbol it's it's not a swastika um, but it is if you turn it you know it's it, it's the same symbol but the, that's all on, this is a, an old, old Indian blanket. And I pieced it together after he gave it to me so that it at least looks like something. Uh, some of the early uh, Indians in this area, there was a French guy named Brule in the 1600s that came down from Canada, came down into the upper part of the Susquehanna River and he came across the Indians up there and he was one of the first people to record that there were Indians in that area and it was in the I believe back in the 16, early 1600s and uh, he followed the river down and, and he got in, involved with the Susquehannock Indians the Susquehannock Indians were what they called giants of men they were huge Indians they weren't like you would see on a TV they, they were massive people and they lived from Tuncanic up along that Susquehanna River all the way up. That's how they, the name of the river got its name. Uh, we had in our area, we had the Iroquois, the Seneca, the Lenny Lenape, the Muncies, um, the Delaware, the, 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 the nations, the, the five nations and then later the six nations. They were all here. They all traveled this area. We had Indians from Florida, that came up later, the, the uh, Shawnee, the Nanakokes. Um, there, there's so many tribes that came through this area because the white men forced them to go someplace else. 
So when, the, when they settled down in Florida and they started moving up the coast, all the Indians lived by the oceans, they lived by the coast, they lived by the lakes, and they eventually got pushed and moved. They came up this way and then they got pushed out west. And that, that's what happened to the Indians that were here. Uh, the Seneca Nation still has a, a, a settlement in Salamanca, New York. If you're ever going out that way, Route 17, going out towards uh, Buffalo, Lake Erie, Jamestown, New York area, you'll see, still see little cabins alongside the road with Indians living in them. They're still living like they did years ago. I mean, I, I drove through there and I can't believe that their, their houses are from this side of the room to this side of the room and that's it. That's as big as they are. They're little one, two room cabins with a chimney. And the, a lot of the people in there, the Indians still live the same way they did years and years ago. Um, I want to get to a, a couple of things. The uh, Indian village at the mouth of the Lackawanna River was called Assurgene. It was uh, a pretty big, pretty big settlement. And the archaeological uh, digs that were there found all kinds of things. The State Museum in uh, Harrisburg has a lot of stuff from Tunkhannock and from there. They don't have it on display. I was down there, I was very disappointed they don't have it out, but they have it in their uh, warehouses and they probably put it out, they do certain exhibits all the time, just like our Everhart Museum does. Um, the lower part of the Lackawanna Valley was called Anjuqua and uh, the Kapous village or Kapoos village was eight miles up from the mouth of the Lackawanna where it met so that was up into Scranton. Uh, they found all kinds of burial mounds up here in Scranton. They took all the artifacts, all the, the, the early settlers that came here and put cabins up. They came in here and they just scourged everything, took everything. They dug out the, the burial grounds and they took all their beads and they took everything. Uh, a lot of the early people like Isaac Troop uh, wrote about it. He had a large collection of things that they, they t took from their burial grounds. Uh, what, the creek that comes down out of Clark Summit and comes down through the valley and comes down and meets the, Sus the Lackawanna River, that's where Kapos Village was, right in that area there, right at the, on this side of that, that stream and on, on the west side of the Lackawanna River. And that's where Kapoos's village was. Um, some of the other Indians that you'll, you'll hear about, uh, uh, this guy was Tediuskung, and he dressed like a Frenchman. He dressed uh, in, he wanted to wear the, the robes and the, the boots and everything that everybody else did. Um, I'll pass that around a little bit and you can just pass it around and look at that. These are things that I've taken out of uh, books from the library. Uh, I've made copies of and, and uh, I research a lot, I read a lot, I, I have a lot of books. Um, in fact, I'm going to actually pass around the arrowheads and you can take a look at them and pa just pass them through so you get a chance because you're not going to all get a chance to come up here and look at them later on so we'll just pass them around and you can take a look at what they what they actually how they actually made them. Uh, the, the arrowheads that they made they're made out of flint and different parts of the country have different parts or kinds of rock and some are, are naturally sharp and they don't have to do a lot to them they're like, almost like glass and you'll see some of them in the box and like some around here it's more of a harder stone and what they do is they chip it they just take a, a heavier stone and they chip the sides and they chip the other sides until they get it to a point where they want it and then they, they uh, use different tools uh, some of the things that the guys that were up in German have they have uh, little rocks with holes in them they're only about this big and they would be for painting their faces they would have ink and their ink was made from plants. They would get different plants that have colors, some have red, and that red was one of their biggest colors and black, of course, from they'd use charcoal and things for painting their eyes. And, but they would take a little rock like that and they'd drill a hole. They'd take a stone that was harder and they would turn it and they would just drill a hole in a stone until they made it into like a little pot. And then they'd put their paint inside those little stones and then they'd dip it with a piece of a stick or a twig, they'd use it like a Q-tip, and then they'd paint their faces, and they'd paint themselves up with, with these, out of these little stones. And uh, they have, uh, also take stones, and they look like a washer. 
they would just take a, a stone and drill a hole in it and they would use that as a bead and they'd wear them that was their necklaces uh, they would also take and make weights for their fishing nets and they would take rocks so that they could tie uh, they'd car chip them so that they could tie a, a string around them rope which back then they didn't know they didn't have rope they used vines they used animal skin they used animal uh, muscle they would take that that's what they used to tie everything they used that on their arrows so they would tie the rocks to their ropes throw them in the river and then they'd fish like like a fisherman did in the over in the Middle East they'd fish with a net and along the Susquehanna River you find a lot of those rocks uh, these guys from Tunkhannock that came down they had a lot of them in their collection uh, you'd be walking walking through the woods and someplace where you know there were Indians if you know what to look for you could find it and that's why I'm starting to learn a little bit more and and being I'm, I'm able to find things that I could never find before when I worked with the archaeological dig up in Tunkhannock every day they would walk across the field they didn't have portal labs they would walk across the field go in the woods and go to the bathroom they'd come back with an with a Indian arrowhead or a spear point and I they take lunch for an hour I'd walk that field up left and right and up and down and crisscross and I come back with nuts and bolts and washers and and I kept telling them well, what? well they said you don't know what you're looking for I said I know what I'm looking for I'm looking for an arrowhead well, they say you don't know how to spot it. They, they, and they just, they, they do it so much, they have a knack. And I worked with nuts and bolts and equipment my whole life, so I was finding the nuts and bolts. So I, I couldn't even get them to give me anything. You know? We can't do that. It's, in a, it's not, we, this all goes to the museum. So. Wasn't there a, a decent sized village at from Canik? There was, there was a lot of villages in Tunkhannock. Yeah. The one I was talking about that I dug on, yeah. right where you come into, uh, from on Route 6, and you start to come into Tunkhannock, there's a bypass road on the left, and then the main road that goes through Tunkhannock. Well, right where the bypass crosses the stream, you'll come to a light, and if you go straight, look to your left, there was a, a, there's a couple of trucks there and a building. Right behind that is a, a field. And that's where the vill one of the big villages was. Uh, another village was, if you go over into Ransom, um, Keith Eckel owns the land now. He, put, he farms it with corn. And there's a cemetery there from 1700s with the gar all the Gardner family. And some of the people that were uh, escaped and then later killed from the from Wyoming Massacre. The, the gravestones are there from the 1700s. It's on their website. Yeah, it's, it's a phenomenal old cemetery with an iron gate around it. And if you go, go into that, over that railroad to that cemetery and then walk that field, that's where all these guys are finding a lot of their stuff. But you have to have permission to go there. You can't just go up and walk the field. But there was a big village there. They find a lot of stuff. That's where they think one of the longhouses was. And it's in the tree, tree area now, and they can't get to it because it's not owned by Keith Eckel, so they can't get permission to get into it. But it's on a curve on the river where it makes sense that a longhouse would be there so they can look down the river and look up the river. They can, they'd be at an angle where they could see every, you know, the Susquehannock Indians coming both ways. Um, uh, a couple of the other things, uh, the, there, was, there were paths, Indian paths around here. Uh, one of them was the Lackawanna path and I have it on this map over here I'll pass the map around this tells you a little bit about it where it is I'll pass it around you can read it real quick because uh, you probably won't get a chance to look at everything but there were paths there were Lackawaxen path uh, the Lackawaxen path was up towards uh, Lake Wallenpapak the Lackawaxen River uh, Kimball's Road is up there uh, one of the, the early, early, early settlers in the area was named Mr. Kimball, and I read a, an account of how he was chased back to his cabin by the Indians, and uh, that was over by the, the uh, just past the, the Lake Wallenpapak area. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of Indian history over there. Uh, Mount Cobb, sitting up on top of the mountain up here. Uh, is where the Indians used to, used to light their fires and later the settlers lit their fires. Uh, they, they, what the Indians would do was light fires on, on the hills to warn the tribes that other Indians were coming. 
and then later the settlers would do the same thing because they seen the Indians doing it. And the settlers all came from uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and they came down in here to settle except for the ones that came from William Penn's area and then they ended up fighting which was the Pennamite Wars. The Connecticut people and the uh, William Penn's people fought here and the Indians fought with them and against them and uh, they, when they settled they came down this way and they came across the tops of these mountains that we have right here at, right to the top of Cobb's Knob, Cobb's Mountain and at, back then they said it was filled with panthers and cougars and uh, that side of the mountain had most of them and over on this side were elk and bear and deer and that's in some of the early accounts that we have. There was an Indian that walked the Lackawanna River as a guide back in the early late 1700s early 1800s and they guided the early coal miners the coal settlers the Wurtz brothers that came up and started mining coal up in Carbondale in 1804 and there was an old Indian that traveled with them I found a little piece of a wagon trail in along the Lackawanna River and it's lined with stones like these it's round stones and they're on both sides of the of the trail and there the trail is no wider than what a wagon would be it would be from here to here that's it not a vehicle it would have been for a, a single wagon and the trail goes along the river and turns and then goes back this way and there's only a little piece of it so I got Walter Avery to go with me from German our historical site he went up and filmed it so this way we at least have it a record of it that it was there but they made you know the, the the early paths and some of them you know you can still find them if you know if you know where they are if you or you get lucky and come across something but it's hard to find anything in the woods because of the the leaves they fall they form topsoil they just cover everything over if you're not digging for it you don't know it's there where was that one that's up in mayfield oh yeah yeah if, if you uh you can, anybody can go up and look at it if if you go to mayfield to the last bridge over the lackawanna river in mayfield right where the the new school was built there used to be the baseball field when i was playing softball and coaching uh, if you went on the left, the west side of the river, went down off the bridge and walked up along the river, it's about 300 yards up in there. You'll find you'll find it if it's not gone by now. I mean, the, the flooding takes and washes things away, so it's very hard to find stuff like that. But I was lucky to find it, and uh, you know, it's still there. I'm, I'm hoping, you know, even if it isn't. If, it, if it's buried it's still there it's still in the ground it's not going to leave because those stones would still be there they'd just be debris over the top of it now this doesn't have a lot to do with Indians but I brought it along because uh, these are from the 1860s so a lot of these would have killed a lot of the Indians uh, these are from the Civil War these are from down south these are these are bullets uh, the ones with three rings are from the Union Army and the ones with two rings are from the uh, Confederate Army. So I'll pass these around and you can feel how heavy uh, these are lead bullets. These are, this is what would have hit the people in the Civil War. But in the 1860s they were still fighting Indians. You know, so we were still out west shooting them with these same kind of bullets. But you'll be able to feel how heavy they are. And then I'm going to I'm going to pass around because because I don't want to spend all the time on the Indians because we chased them out of here. <laughs> How about Moosic Mountain? Nothing in the Moosic Mountain area? Uh, the Moosic Mountain had a lot of snakes. <laughs> <laughs> and they still do. One of them was a commissioner. <laughs> More than one. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> but no, there, there, was, there were Indians all over this area. All over this area. And like I said, I found that bowl in a place where I never thought I would find in Indians. But then after, after I found it, I walked up over the, the hill on the other side. We came down this side. I walked up over the hill on the other side and it was completely flat. It was a small area, I would say half the size of this room maybe, the, the whole room. But it was perfectly flat, which tells me that that would be a perfect spot to put a campsite, to, to put a little small village. And the stream, you got to understand the streams that we see now are minute compared to what they would have been back then. 
because the Indians, the early Indians, walked ahead of the glaciers. And they, that's where they, how they hunted. They, the animals moved as the glaciers moved. The animals moved. And the early, early, early inhabitants of this country who some of them came across the glaciers from the other continents, they came over here and they followed the animals. So they followed the glaciers and they, they tried to stay ahead of them following the, the animals because where the glaciers were, there was nothing left. So when the glaciers receded, these streams were huge. I mean, this valley that we're in was covered with water from one end to the other. It was, it was, it was massive. And then as, it, as they receded, then those streams were, so that stream, that little tiny stream that I seen maybe this wide, when that Indian was there, could have been 10 feet wide, could have been five, four or five feet deep, and could have been teeming with fish. So it makes sense that they would have lived on the plateau above it and fished down below it. Because the little trees that are there now weren't there. It could have been an area that the trees were gone from the glaciers and didn't grow yet, so it would have been an ideal hunting and fishing area for them. And there were caves not too far, so you know there were fox and bear and, and all kinds of animals because they know that, the, you know, that's what they did. They hunted animals and that's what they lived off. Uh, this bullet here was a handmade bullet. Um, this one is the same as the ones in the case. I'll pass this around as well. This was made by a soldier, and I don't know whether it was Confederate or Union soldier, but it, was, it, it doesn't have the ring, so it wasn't made by a factory. Now, a lot of these soldiers made their own bullets. They had their own lead, they melted it down, and they made their own bullets. So this was a handmade one. And these little balls uh, are what they call grape shots. Grape shots were, when they shot these cannons, they had can, cannon balls that exploded in the air and these is what came out of it and they were projectiles so you know you can imagine the devastation of a hundred of these little lead balls coming at you as you're running towards the the other side so these are uh, what they call grape shots and uh, they come out of a cannon blast it'd be like a canister uh, the canister would, would be like a like a coffee can in a cannon and when it shot out it would explode, the can would, would explode, open up, and these grape shots would come out and scatter against the people coming the other way. Um, the last family of Indians that we know of in Pennsylvania were the corn planter family. Oh, yeah. Corn planter was a famous Indian chief. Um, their family in 1964 were, were chased out of their land and uh, their land was up where the Kinzua Dam is now. They were going to build the Kinzua Dam in western Pennsylvania and that's where corn planters land was and they took the land from the Indians and built the dam. And those Indians are part of those Seneca Nation that's up there in Salamanca, New York and uh, up in the, the lower part of New York State on the western side. Um, uh, the Indians in this area were displaced by the colonists from 1690 all the way up into the 1700s, uh, early 1800s, and they just kept getting pushed western, farther and farther. The walking purchase is a very famous part of Indian history in 1737. Uh, the Indians were going to make a deal with the white men to take a piece of land. They, white people wanted to buy a piece of land. Well, the Indians' way of giving land was whatever you could walk in a day, that was what they considered a piece of land that you were going to get for the amount of trinkets. Well, the white people said, well, we're going to be smarter than that. We're going to make you run. So they ran for a day, and they had guys who were athletes that, like, you know, just like the Greeks when they ran marathons. Well, they had somebody run for a day. And what they did was they, they uh, ended up getting three, four, five, six times the amount of land that the Indians were willing to give up. And the Indians at the time honored the deal because they said, whatever you can, you can go, travel in a day, because they never ran, they walked. So they didn't expect the white man to run. So they honored the deal, but later on they got mad about it. And that's when a couple of the Indian chiefs were killed. 
some of the chiefs that were good friends of the white men because they agreed to the deal and some of the Indians killed the other Indians because they were mad about it. That's when they started fighting with the, the white settlers here again. Uh, our white settlers came here from Connecticut in the 1750s, somewhere around there, and built some cabins in Scranton, Capoose section. Uh, there was a lot of stories about the cabins being raided. Uh, people being kidnapped. There's one story where uh, a boy and a girl were kidnapped and the boy was scalped and the girl got away. Uh, there's another story where a guy was kidnapped, taken up to New York uh, to the settlements up there and he later got away and came back and told the story about it. Uh, there's story, There's places where they were, uh, you know, the cabins were burnt right to the ground and all their animals were killed and things like that. The, the corn that they planted were, were taken by the Indians and uh, the settlers from Connecticut all left. They took off and went back to Connecticut. What was left of them? Well then they came back again a year later the next season and they brought more people, more guns and they built bigger villages and eventually that's what happened to the Indians in our area. They eventually ended up leaving. The 40 Fort Massacre was part of our history. Indians were involved with that. Uh, that's where the stories come about the gold that was taken from 40 Fort and buried up in the Archibald Mountain. Uh, that's, that's where some caves, the Indian caves are. Uh, there's an air, you found the caves? You found the gold. What are you doing here? <laughs> you found the caves. Uh, he didn't find the gold, but he found the caves. <laughs> and he won't tell you where the caves are either. But uh, Bald Mountain, well... Where's Bald Mountain? Oh, it's at Archibald Mountain. Okay. Well, there's a lot of stories about Bald Mountain. Gold up there, silver. You're talking about a silver mine and a gold mine, and there were there were, uh, uh, salt mines here. And one of the, the they talk about Bald Mountain. Well, my thoughts of Bald Mountain are in Ransom. Yep. It's right. Bald Mountain. It sits up there. It's called Bald Mountain. Well, you go over on this side of the mountain. And you go up from Wilkesbury up 115, and there's Bald Mountain Road. That was called Bald Mountain. Down across from 40 Fort, where the Wyoming Massacre was, you go up on top of that mountain, and there's a map that says Bald Mountain. <laughs> so if you're looking for Bald Mountain and the Indians' gold and silver, you got a lot of looking to do. There's a lot of areas called Bald Mountain, so that's, it's a pretty amazing thing. Um, That's the question. Yeah. You said there were a lot of different Indian tribes. When the colonists were coming over and, you know, pushing them out, so to speak, were there a lot of factions between these tribes that they didn't think enough to band together? Yes, there was. To, yeah. You know, yeah, the, the Indians fought constantly. Uh, there were Indians, uh, even down in the Chesapeake Bay, when they first came into the Chesapeake Bay and they met the Indians there, there was another tribe of Indians that battled with these Indians all the time. So the first group of Indians tried to get the early, early settlers to side with them to fight the other Indians to get them out of their area so that they would, uh, would be able to, to take over that whole area by themselves. The Susquehannock Indians, which were very fierce fighters, they, they would not be you know be messed with by anybody they, they were the the fiercest fighters around so a lot of the tribes from this side stayed in this valley they didn't want to go there um, the Muncie tribe uh, the the village like that Capos had they were sent here because they were siding with the white people and they were considered to be weak and like women is what they actually what it said you are like women. We don't want you here. And you're going to this area, and they sent them to Scranton. So it's just like everything else. Everything, everything comes to Scranton, and, you know. But, but that's, that's how they got here. They were forced out of their area and forced to come here to live. And it was like, like their penance, you know. This is where you're going to go. You're going to go to this valley. We don't want you up here. They were the, part of the Delaware and they were up by the Delaware River, which there's a lot of settlements up by the Delaware River. Uh, you'll see on some of the maps, and this map here will show you. Uh, this shows you the Buffalo Swamp, the Great Swamp, 
uh, Indian paths all through through Pennsylvania and uh, some of the, the big Indian villages I'll We'll pass that up, down and bring it back up. Up at the top of the Susquehanna River, up by Milford, New Milford, I mean, up by New Milford, Great Bend. Uh, there was there were a lot of Indian villages up there. As the river turned and got up into the New York State a little bit more, there were big Indian villages up there. If you went up uh, from Lenox, Lenoxville, and I think it's 29, it takes you up to Susquehanna. If you go straight up that road, there was an Indian village up there in Susquehanna at the top of that. Uh, like I said, there was an Indi Indian village in Tunkhannock. There was an Indian village in Scranton. There were small little villages all over. Like I said, I got artifacts from Chapman Lake. That was a small little village at Chapman Lake. Indians would, they would go to the lakes and streams and, and live there because that was where the food was. So any place, and if... Today I got the chance to, to ride, do the first, I had never done this in my life, I'm almost 62 years old, I've never been in the air. Today I had to go and inspect, do an environmental inspection for the job, I had to go in a helicopter. One of them little bubble helicopters. And we were flying over this whole area, and I'm amazed at how much water is around, is around here. I mean, you, you talk about the lakes you know, but you don't know about the ponds and the swamps and the streams and everything else. When you're up there, and you're flying slow. Well, he's 110 miles an hour. That's slow, I guess. But it feels like you're not moving. But when you're up there and you're looking, I, I was amazed at these mountains that we have here and the, and the water that's here. You imagine back then, like I said, after the, the ice age and all the water that was, this, this, was whole, this was like probably like an ocean at one time. And, you know, as it receded, that's where the Indians started to settle close to the water. They fished and hunted in the Lackawanna River. Uh, the early, early records of the Lackawanna River say they were teeming with colorful fish, like trout, rainbow trout, brook trout. And the early books that you could find down at the uh, library, they go back into the early 1700s, late 1700s, and they talk about all the, the animals that were along the river, the, the beaver that had dams on the river and, and all the fox and the squirrels and everything that they hunted and how much animal life was here. And, you know, people hunted here forever. I mean, there were elk, there's, there's lodges all over the place named Elk Lodge and Elk Mountain. I mean, they were, they were here because we have elk. There were, there were a lot of elk here. There was moose here. There was panthers here. There was all kinds of wildlife. So there were, it's, a, it's an ideal place for Indians to, to settle and live. They were protected in the Lackawanna Valley just like we are protected. We're protected by the mountains on both sides. Winter, winter is not as bad in the Lackawanna Valley as it is farther north. It's not as flooded like it is in the Susquehanna Valley. We don't get tornadoes. They go over the top of the, they come over the mountain and go over the other top of the mountain. They don't hit in the valley. We don't get the bad weather in there, so it's an ideal location for Indians to live. It's just like it's an ideal place for us to live, except we had to dig coal here and make it a mess. But <laughs> if we didn't dig coal here, my English and Welsh people that I'm related to wouldn't have came here, and I might still be over in England giving this speech, talking funny and drinking tea. <laughs> and I'd be playing football instead of football. Uh, I'm going to ask if there's any questions, if there's anything anybody would like to know, because I could go on forever with the notes that I have. Like, you know, we, talk, we can go back to 1608 and talk about Captain John Smith and, and uh, the Indians that he met. And, and that Indian guy who used to take people up and down the river, what was his name? Oh, I can't remember his name, but uh, it was... I'd like to Google that and just see it. Yeah, it's, it's, in a, it's in one of the books. His name is in there. And I can't remember it. I could probably find it. I probably wrote it down someplace because I, I write everything down. I don't throw anything away. Yeah. Ask my wife. <laughs> I see your museum. So I, know. <laughs> I keep at, at the top of the 80s, you're going down there in Cunningham Valley. Somebody said at the top of that mountain up there, is, is, it's called Council Cup. That's where all the Indians used to gather. Yes. I, I bought my camper from Council Cup Trailer. So I know what you're talking about. And I talked to the two brothers that were there that sold me the camper. And the reason we talked about it was because I was a, in the Boy Scouts and I went to Philmont, New Mexico. And the Boy Scouts, of course, take a lot of their stuff from the Indians. But I got talking with them and I asked them, I, first thing I asked them, did you guys ever find any Indian artifacts down here? 
And they were telling me, loaded. Every place you went, every field down there is loaded with Indian artifacts. Right up on top of that mountain is where they, they lived and they fished and lived down by the river. Same as up in Tunkhannock. Right along the Susquehanna River, any place there's a wide open area, you're going to find artifacts. Uh, there's, there's markers on, this, on the trail going down, uh, I think it's 92, where the Sullivan March was, where when after the 40 Fort massacre, uh, General Sullivan came to, to go back and go after the Indians. That's, that was his job. He was going to go kill every Indian that he could find. And he traveled along that road, Route 92, along the left-hand side of the river. There's markers all along there you could read. Sullivan, and uh, Sullivan's, Sullivan's Trail, it's called. And it goes all the way up into uh, New York State. And there's a big uh, marker up there on Route 17 where there was a massacre of the Indians when Sullivan found a big village. And then he went right up into the Finger Lakes, the S Lake Seneca, which are named after the Indians. And Lake, you know, it's like Cayuca Lake and, and all of them. They're all, that's where the big Indian villages were there. And he went in there and he devastated and wiped out all the Indians and then came back down around the Susquehanna and back to Allentown, Philadelphia area where he came from. Um, there's a marker on top of one of the hills before you get up to Falls. And on top of it, it talks about the Indian village that's directly across the river from that marker, but the guy that owns it won't let you on it. But the two guys that were talking to us in, in German, they, uh, they weren't speaking in German. <laughs> they were speaking in German, at, but not in German. <laughs> but they, when they came up, they were telling me about the furnaces, the Indian furnaces they found, Indian ovens that they found. He won't tell me where they are, but he found them. He, there's an Indian cabin, not too far from Falls. And this one guy lives by falls, and he finds a lot of stuff. That's where he finds all the fish net uh, weights, the net weights that he they tied off. He finds a lot of them up by falls, around the turn. There used to be an old bridge that went across there, and people. I've got pictures of it back in the turn of the century. But uh, there, there's a lot of artifacts up along that river on both sides, all the way up through Mahoopany, all the way up to Mishapin and Tioga and you know, all the way to the end of it, you're going to find any, any place there's a low-lying flat area where that was open that wouldn't flood a lot, they would build a village there. That's where they hunted and fished. They had a lot of land to explore. Yeah, and I'm getting old. <laughs> My. I always thought that the Lackawanna River came from the north to the south. It's not. The Lackawanna? Yeah, it's going from the south to the north. It flows, right? No, the Lackawanna, the Lackawanna flows from the north to the south. Okay. It actually flows north and east and west and south, and it just keeps. It's been displaced so many times, uh, from especially up in our area in German. That river is not where it was. It's been moved a lot of times. But the coal miners moved it. Uh, they wanted to dig where the river was. They moved the river. Uh, you know, and that's that's what they did. What about uh, around the uh, like the Borge area? Was there anything? That area? That's where the first, uh, I'm, I'm assuming they fished there. I, I don't know of any artifacts that were found there, but you think with the, with the waterfall like that and the caves that would have been around there, there'd be a lot of places. I have never heard of anything being found there. Now, maybe something in the, in the Everhart Museum, maybe they could tell us a little bit more. Uh, we don't have a museum in our area that has stuff like that. Everything is down in the State Museum. Uh, the Lackawanna Historical Society might have some, some information on that, but I, I really don't know. I, I've never heard of anything by that gorge being found, but, but it wouldn't surprise me that it was because it's, it's an ideal place. I mean, you know, anywhere there's running water, anywhere where there's fishing, anywhere. Nayog itself is an Indian name. Nayog is an Indian name. Uh, Muzik is an Indian name. Uh, I've got a list here of, you know, Lackawanna is an Indian name, Susquehanna is an Indian name. Um, I don't know if I brought the list with me, but uh, there, just about everything around here is named after the Indians. I don't know if I brought that list or not. And you had Francis Slocum who was taken out of there in uh, 1787, down in Wilkes-Barre. Yeah. Captured 
captured by the Indians. Francis Slocum State Park is named after him. Um, see, Indians were here in, in the 1200s. They were here. I mean, they're, they're called, there was the Paleo Indians, and and you know the modern woodland Indians are what we're referring to in most of our speaking. We we know of of the Indians that were around when the white people came here. Like I said, the Indians that were here before that, we don't know a lot about them because they, they never wrote anything and no white men ever seen them. There were Indians hunting here long before white people even came to this country. You know, before, before the 1500s, before Columbus came here in 1400s, uh, before the Norsemen came here, there were, there were Indians here. They were a different kind of Indians. They were, you know, they're, uh, the Indians that, that we know of are the, the Indians that we see, you know, records of because we interacted with them. The white people interacted in, in, and listened to the Indians. One of the, one of the stories that I, I like to talk about is the, they ask, they, they got to know these, the Indians and got to be able to interpret what they were saying. And they were asking the one Indian about where he came from. And he didn't understand what they were saying. And he just kept pointing, and no, and they kept saying, "No, where did where did you come from? Where your your ancestors is what they what he was trying to get out of them." And they talked about I'm trying to think of how exactly to, it, it came about, but they talked about a tree, and out of the tree came a man, and then the tree bent over and touched the ground and the roots you know how you take a tree like a vine it'll go in the ground it'll reroot and come back up like a raspberry bush well out of that tree that went into the ground came a woman and that's what they talk about and then there's other Indians that talk about the turtle and that man came from the turtle and it came out of the mud and that was where their ancestors came from. So there's different, and they all talk about one God. Yep. The Indians all talked about, they, they didn't worship all kinds of gods. There was one God. They worshiped birds, not worship, but they thought of birds as, you know, being spiritual in certain ways. And, you know, they named their firstborn after the first thing they seen. There's a joke about that, but I can't tell it. <laughs> but they, that's, that's what they did. They, uh, th they honored one God. They didn't call it God, but it was a spiritual being. Creator. They're one creator. And that's, the Indians talk about it. So, I mean, it came in through their interpretation. I can go on forever. I, I talk for, for all night long if you want, but I know Joe's wandering around here. I think he wants me to, to be quiet. Are there any more questions? Is there anything you'd like to ask? That stone you found in the stream, that had to have been worked by it was chipped. It was chipped out by a harder stone. They, they had stones that were like chisels. Now they take a stone like this, feel this. Tell me you couldn't chip something out of, the, out of another stone with something like that. It's of iron ore in it, huh? It's heavy. <laughs> but that, that's a tool like that, when you, when you take that and hit it with another big rock, chips a smaller rock and chips, chips out a, a, the center of a bowl. Well, that looks pretty smooth. See, this, yeah. this was laying in the stream just like this. This is what they would either, and you could see how it's charred where it was by the fire. Whether they cooked in it, I don't know. Whether they churn, they crushed their meal in it, I don't know. Or whether they just ate out of it. It's it's hard to say. You can take a look at it. You had to know what you were looking for. You know, like that. Like I said, I just, just happened to be there. I just, you know, here, here's a small tool. You say corning work. Yeah. <laughs> here's a small tool that's like a chisel, just shaped just like a chisel. You know, they would take and they would chip and chip and chip and, and make their spear points with it. Um, you know, they, this could have been broke off later. It could have had a flat head where they would hit it with another rock. But that's what they would use to chip like the center of a bowl or make, make their tools. Don't forget, they didn't have iron. You know, they, the early Indians didn't. They, they, everything was made out of wood, rock, animals. Whatever they could find. There was an Indian in that group that had copper. There were Indians that had copper. The Aztecs, Aztec Indians had no, no, no. copper. Here locally. 
I doubt that. Yeah? Taylor, uh, Taylor Yards. Well, I have a book on the Taylor Indians, but it didn't say anything. There's an Indian book all about the Indians in Wyoming. Okay. And in there it mentions about six different Indians, and one of them had metal, and they lost it. Went back to the Stone Age. They had copper. Well, I know they had copper because they wore copper bracelets. The Aztecs and the early Indians in the no, southern I part. Now, the Aztecs are way down south. I know, they're right down here. south, but I'm just saying if they had them, there's a good possibility that the Indians up here had them. But, see, we, they, they would have brought that from the west because there's no copper mines here. There's in Wyoming County, Root Hollow, there's a little copper mine in out front on 29. It's called Copper Mine Hill. See, I didn't know that. They have up, copper. Up the Root Hollow Road, which actually wow. goes over the mountain to Forkston, way back in there, there's a like a dog hole to crawl in. I don't know who. Okay. Is that done by the Indians or white men? I don't know that. I don't know anything about that. Copper mines out in the Delaware River, Paracory, where they were going to build a Tox Island Dam. And the Dutch came all the way down from the Sopus, which is Kingston, mm -hmm. made a hundred mile road, and they mined that copper and took it back up to the Hudson. That's in the 1600s. That would have been the 1600s, yeah. And they call it Paracory Township, and it's old mine road. There's a neat little book on it. It was the first road made in America, you know, yeah. in the 1600s. But that was the Dutch. Okay. Well, I know the, the Indians out west had copper because they had copper bracelets. They had copper in their necklaces and jewelry. So they, you know, they knew about copper, but, you know, uh, I didn't they, know it was around here. That's... Michigan, they had boulders, and there was pure copper chunks in the boulders. And the Indians up around Michigan extracted that copper and used it. That's probably where the copper came from for these Indians here. Okay. Me. Yep. This brings me to a point, if I can interrupt. If you don't keep track of your own family history, you're going to wind up just like these other Indians. We don't know that anything about them. Uh, you, could, you're, you could be descended from the handmaiden who handed Cleopatra the ass. But if nobody wrote it down, it's a rumor. So what I suggest you do, since we're a genealogical society, don't do like the Indians did, and not write anything down and make it available for posterity. Write down even the smallest little things. I'd love to find out what my grandfather thought of uh, anything, just if he had written it down. So today you're blessed because you can take a camcorder, and we'll even take a picture of you anyhow. We can do a camcorder of you reminiscing your earlier life and we can make a DVD out of that and you can give that to all your grandkids and great grandkids because they're into that stuff. They know what DVDs and CDs are and you'll have a, a, a legacy that's beyond any kind of fortune you can leave me. So I suggest you consider that. It took me 36 years to do it. Last. It's what? It took me 36 years to go back. Yeah, he said he went back to the 1600s. Oh, yeah. Yep. You do that, Joe? I mean, you, like you just said, I mean, if you have a, a story to tell, you, you save it. You can yeah, you, yeah. You do that kind of thing here? Yeah, we do it. We, do it. we come to your house and do it. We do this all the time. We're going up to Tompkinsville. You know where Tompkinsville is? Yeah, certainly do. Well, the Tompkins family wants us to record the, the cemetery and all the Tompkins and what the elder people remember about it. And they will give them a DVD or a CD, depending on the size of it. And they can make as many copies as they want and give them to their children, grandchildren, or keep it as a family treasure. We'll keep a copy here and we, we digitize everything. So we could then go uh, 40 years from now, 30 years from now, and show what the Tompkins family in 1999 or Tompkins family in 2015 thought of their 1,800 relatives. And we have a script of 100 and 106 questions that we can ask the people and start sparking their mind about third grade in school and uh, their first kiss or their first date or anything like that. And it's, it's interesting reading, or viewing I should say, for the younger generation. I remember we lived in Lancaster, we had a condo there and the people in the next condo had a lot more money than we did and their daughter got married and they gave her a T-bird for her wedding. The other family weren't as well off, and they gave their son, the groom, uh, a bunch of notebooks, or not notebooks, photograph albums, of his very first kindergarten picture, and his very first report card, and 
his little league baseball and everything up until the time they got married. Well, 10 years later, that T-Bird was an old car, but now they had kids looking at mom and dad's family album. Yep. So which, which had the more value? That's right. And that's what I'm trying to encourage you to do. We, we live in a world where we think all this stuff is just doesn't mean anything. Does that mean I can, get that, does that mean I can get that T-Bird cheap now? We've been interviewing people in Oxford. And some of the stories we're getting on drawing up around, one guy was 93. I said, was there any pole sitters like they had years ago sitting on a He said, no, but there was a guy that wanted to be buried in the ground on a bed. So they built a wooden coffin, dug a hole, put him in it, put it in the ground. They had a pipe so they could send water and food down. And he lasted 35 days on the ground. The only reason he came up was to start raining. The box started filling up with water. But we're sitting there laughing like crazy, interviewing this guy. We never heard a story like that. I said, it's kind of quiet and archable now compared to what they used to do. <laughs> he had been two sandwiches short of a picnic to one. <laughs> but the point is, these are all your family. Your family, I mean, there'll never be another you. Uh, and I mean, I like to. I mean, most people that come in here to start doing genealogy are in their forties plus, and they all say, "I wish I started earlier. I wish I knew my grandmother. I wish I knew my great grandmother." Yeah. Well, this is an opportunity for you to solve that question for all those people yet unborn. So I encourage you to do it. We do it for nothing. We we have a, we have two cameras. We have a, a CD costs ten cents. So I mean, it doesn't cost a lot of money. We're not even going to bill you. The ten cents, you know what I mean? But it's 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 something you really want to consider. Uh, thank you, Bruce, very much. I have a hand for Bruce if we can. Thank you. I'm glad Joe said that though, because we started a historical society in German, and Walter Avery, who's in his seventies, I guess now. Walter uh, has been my grandfather, and, and the stories that they used to tell that I didn't pay any attention to. You know, but I, I do remember a lot of the names. I remember a lot of the, the colloquialisms that, the, you know, the different names for parts of town. A German had, uh, German and Mayfield had Hunky Hill. Uh, they, had, they had Pasty Hill. They had... Uh, Smoketown. Uh, yeah, they had different yeah. names for the, like, the, 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 it's funny the way the people settled in our town. Like, the Irish lived on this side of the street, and one, one section in Gibson Avenue was Irish. The Catholic, Italian Catholic lived on Madison Avenue, where the Catholic Church is. Jefferson Avenue and Lincoln Avenue were the English and Welsh, the primitive Methodists and the Methodists. They all lived in that area. Yeah. The Russians and the Polish in German lived in East Germany, and that's where the Russian church is. And in Mayfield, the very few... The Nebraska section. The Nebraska section. You know why it's called Nebraska? Uh, they weren't Cornhusker fans, no. I know that. <laughs> there was a land giveaway in 1900, 1901, 1903. So all the people that lived in that East German section, uh, maybe 20 or 30 families, went out to Nebraska to get some free land. And all you had to do was live on it for three years and farm it, and then the land was yours. But apparently there was tough times out there. There was snowstorms and blizzards, and they couldn't even uh, farm the property. So when they came back... As a pejorative, the people in German called him Nebraska because they couldn't make it in Nebraska. So that's the Nebraska section of German. But all these little sayings are priceless if you remember them and relate them on to somebody else. Because how many times do we look, people come in here with photographs? Uncle Bill and Aunt Mary. Uncle Bill who and Aunt Mary who? You know, but until you know who it is, so even go home and date the back and put all your photographs right on the back of them. Uncle Bill Jones and Aunt Mary Smith. I have pictures yeah. of my family that have no writings on them and they're, they're from the 1800s, yeah. the way they're dressed. I have no clue yeah. so they are. If you learn anything here tonight besides all the Indians, you want to learn to go home and take care of your own family history stuff. I, I urge you to do that.